from Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. <laughs> a funny thing happened to me on the way to the studio. I met a woman who sleeps with cats. A woman who sleeps with cats? Yeah, Mrs. Cat. <laughs> <laughs> CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. This afternoon, the workshop examines another little understood aspect of man's behavior, humor, in Colloquy 4, the Joe Miller Joke Book, produced in Hollywood by William N. Robeson and conducted by Dr. Frank C. Baxter, professor of English literature at the University of Southern California. Dr. Baxter. If, if you fear that your radio is receiving two programs simultaneously here, one of very old jokes and the other a talk on literature, then don't touch the dial. Believe me, this is all one program. Now, my own interest in the ancient wheeze is a scholarly one, stemming from the fact that jokes have always had a very real part in literature, at least as long as we have the spoken word. Moreover, there's always been a hardening feeling of immediacy about jokes, not only because so many are topical, but because in one way or another, we all use jokes with gratifying regularity. Some of us tell a joke to fortify a point we wish to make, to entertain, to enhance ourselves thus in the opinion of others. Or perhaps we tell them for the laudatory purpose of relieving the tedium of some dull occasion. Now I can best show you what I mean by bringing you a few examples perhaps of a classic joke, a classic teller, and a typical occasion. Let's start with a man who's almost a semi-pro in the field, the after-dinner speaker. Uh, friends, uh, <clears throat> put away your watches. I'm not going to talk for an hour. In fact, the brevity of my remarks reminds me of what Abe Lincoln once said when his tailor suggested maybe Lincoln's legs were too long. No, Sam, the president said. I reckon they're just long enough. They reach the ground, don't they? <laughs> and all of us have met this next fellow, the self-appointed life of the party. <laughs> Hey, you heard the latest story about the farmer's daughter? <laughs> well, the farmer did, and now she can never darken his door again. <laughs> Even learned men with professional degrees use jokes tellingly. As for example now, the glib and successful trial lawyer. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I assure you I'm implying no criticism of my worthy opponent who found it necessary to address you for two hours and a half. But he did put me in mind of an old farmer they say Andrew Jackson came across one day. It seems the farmer was feeding his mule one piece of straw at a time. Neighbor, old Hickory finally said, feeding your mule that way, isn't that going to take a long time? Well, General, the rustic said slowly, reckon it will. But what's time to a stupid old jackass? <laughs> Yes. And let's not overlook the determinedly cheerful wife who feels she has to greet her husband gaily when he returns from a grueling day at the office. Now, Henry, just lie back there and relax while I tell you. I heard the funniest story today. Okay. Do you know what one merry-go-round horse said to the other merry-go-round horse, Henry? Yeah. Let's get off this merry-go-round and get married. I'm sick and tired of going around with you. Oh, <laughs> And finally, finally, the man whose living depends on telling jokes, the comedian. Hey, buddy, do you know why cream costs more than milk? No, tell me, my boy. Why does cream cost more than milk? <laughs> because, stupid, it's harder for the cows to sit on those tiny little bottles. <laughs> <laughs> and there, happily, there ends our illustration. Now, admittedly, these were old, old jokes. But if you make the common error of classifying them as Joe Miller's, you're wrong. They're much older. Every one of those jokes, in one form or another, was already old before Joe Miller was born. Oh, oh, professor, Professor, are you trying to tell us that there actually was a Joe Miller? Yes. Though the records are unclear as to the year of his birth, we do know that he died in London in 1738. Oh, I get it. Joe Miller lived. It's his jokes that died. Oh, on the contrary, <laughs> Joe Miller died. His jokes live on forever. But I'd always heard Joe Miller was, uh, you know, sort of a myth, an excuse for a bum joke. No, Miller was an actual person. But oddly enough, not only did Joe Miller never utter a joke himself, 
The book bearing his name was published more than a year after he died. Oh, come on. You know, I think Joe Miller's still alive, and he's on my payroll as a writer under an assumed name. He's my (laughs) brother-in-law. Dr. Baxter, you've made some pretty fantastic allegations. Are you able to prove any part of them? Well, yes, Counselor. It happens that I have with me several monographs written by Joe Miller's own contemporary. In a court of law, Doctor, that would be inadmissible as evidence. It's hearsay. Out and out hearsay. However, since you claim he's dead, acceptable proof would be the corpus itself. Now, now that's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Even for a lawyer? It isn't quite as impossible as it might at first seem. Oh, now what sort of mumbo-jumbo is that? Either you can produce Joe Miller or you cannot. You know, I don't see why I shouldn't try to produce him in this Bridie Murphy age of supersonic animation, automation, mechanical brains, technology more baffling than Merlin. Even though I do not pretend myself to be a pure scientist, merely a sometime student, this cause is a worthy one, and the end, if I succeed in materializing Joe Miller, merits the mean. The means are never very far away these days. Now, here beside me, I just happen to have a mammoth mechanical brain. I insert this punch card in it. I depress button A, so. I throw the switch marked go, go, go. And behold, we get... Joe Miller here. Can you read me? Yes, Joe. We read you five by five. This is Dr. Frank Baxter of the University of Southern California. Ah, yes, Doctor. Is there some service I am able to perform for you? Some forgotten speech of Will Shakespeare's or Ben Johnson, perchance? No, Joe, not today. But right now, I'd like you to drop down here. It is down, isn't it, Joe? There is. <laughs> Good. Well, then, would you drop down for a few moments? Provide the answers to the questions I have for you? Uh, well, so be it, good doctor. Can you direct me to your meeting place? Well, now, let's see. Let me focus. Yes. Now, go past that first thunderhead on the left, turn sharp at that fluffy gathering of cumulus, and then slide down the slightly tarnished rainbow. Straight ahead. Ah, yes, friend Baxter. I see it now. Roger, Wilco, and out. (laughs) Joe Miller. Greetings, good friends. And which of you chances to be the usher in literature, Dr. Baxter? I'm the dominee, Joe. I want you to know how much I appreciate this cooperation of yours. The least I can do for a fellow student and player. Now, how may I serve you? Would you just tell my friends here who you are, what you were, what connections, if any, you had with that famous book entitled Joe Miller's Jests? Oh, Joe Miller's Jests. Ah, The pucks on it and the fulsome knaves who foisted it upon a half-witted world. I bite my thumb at them, sir. We'll stipulate the pox, Miller, but let's get to the testimony. The professor here alleges you never wrote a joke. I, sir, nor never spoke one. You see, good friends, I was a leading tragedian in London theaters, and a splendid one, if I say so myself, which I gladly do. I was a leading tragedian and not a comic clown. At the time in London, we had a self-styled critic of the drama, a suet head, one John Motley. Uh, Mutley was an obituary of a tavern I frequented, which was the gathering place for all the mountebanks and roisterers from the theatres royal of Covent Garden and Drury Lane. John Gay, he who wrote the Beggar's Opera, among other things. Mr. Professor Lacey, all of them, the actors, the writers of midday. This was that famous public house on Portsmouth Street? Aye, friend Dominic. Well, to get on, this, this knave, this Mutley, had a good thing going for him which profited him much. Although it was equally a brim with chicanery. You mean he had a racket? (laughs) He invented the rackets, this varlet. Would an actor buy Motley all the ale and sack he could hold, Motley in turn would publish glowing notices on the player's performances. A trap into which I would not fall. Good for you, Mr. Meller. Ah, me thanks, madam. And here, perhaps, it is best I explain that my chiefest misfortune was the maid I had wed, my wife. Comely, but a complete shrew. So perhaps you can understand that after an evening's performance, I would repair to the tavern, spurning Motley and his noisome companion, and sit alone at the table, the bonny face reserved for me exclusively, dreading the hour when I must return to my home 
And Dame Miller. So all right already. Then what happened? Well, after my constant rebuffs, by his good opinion, Motley became so enraged he determined he would shame me or ruin my repute as a leading tragedian. So, one day when he came upon an ancient jest so creaky of the joint it was repulsive, he determined his chance to destroy me had come. He waited until every... Friends, imbibers, and countrymen, lend me your ears. I have a jest to tell you. A rib tickler just told me about that ever-popular tragedian, none other than Joe Miller. Joe Miller. <laughs> Here is the jape as Miller told it to me. A man asked his neighbor, but late married to a widow, how he agreed with his wife. Marvelous well, the neighbor replied. When I am merry, she is merry. When I am sad, she is sad. For when I go out, I am merry to go from her. And when I return, she is sad to see me. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, instead of being greeted with groans and catcalls, Muttley was filled with amaze to find he had evoked gales of leg-slapping laughter. Bitter and baffled, he managed to get aside John Gay and beseeched him to explain this unexpected outburst of mirth. <laughs> Holding his sides, Gay managed to <laughs> Oh, friend Motley, don't you see? It isn't a hoary jest. <laughs> what makes it comical is that a vinegar visage like that henpecked Miller should tell it. <laughs> Aye, Motley, that's what makes it funny. Joe Miller telling any joke. <laughs> and there I was... Hoist by Motley's own petard. They didn't blame you for the bad joke, Mr. Miller? They, madam, to the contrary. They found that to ascribe a jest to me was better insurance than had it been written by Lloyd's Coffee House. So from that night on, all ancient japes told in the city were laid at my door. But Motley, at first deflated, finally wreaked his revenge on me. How did he do that, Joe? So identified did I become with jests and jibes that my very presence in a play would set an audience to convulsions. And since I was a tragedian, soon no theatrical manager in London would give me employ. I died not too long after. A broken man. Oh. Well, granting all that, you still haven't explained that book bearing your name. Aye. I come now to that, sir. Upon my demise, one Thaddeus Reed, a shrewd publisher of folios, sought out Motley and proposed he collect the deadliest of the jokes being told and publish them as Joe Miller's. Motley refused to have anything to do with the publication which might perpetuate my name until we tempted him with visions of heady profits. Motley, lend ear to me. There is a fortune in the book of Jess. I will not be associated with Joe Miller, that penurious, unfriendly, untalented... Not for, say, a hundred pounds. Not for a thousand pounds, you mean... How much, friend Reed, from a book of jokes? I know not, except the rewards are limitless. Recall you Miles Coverdale's Bible, published in 1535. Oh, yes. Coverdale Coverdale. obtained the funds to publish the Bible by issuing a collection of jokes nine years earlier. The one eclipsed a hundred married tales. And a century ago, in 1630, the court jester Archie Armstrong published his book, and both volumes still are in good demand at the stalls. Well, John... Will you join me in this enterprise? Aye, but on one condition. All London knows of my distaste for Joe Miller. And I do not wish to be made a laughingstock. I shall set down these jokes, but not under my own name. We shall create a pseudonym for the acknowledged editor. Excellent, John. And there you have the entire sordid story of Joe Miller's jests, or the wit varimicum... Edited by Elijah Jenkins, Esquire, and published by T. Reed, Anno Domini, 1739. No, Joe, that was a story well told indeed. Thank you, Dr. Baxter. One and all. And now my duty has been discharged. I must be going. Forsooth. How far sooth are you going, Joe? <laughs> a plague on you, sir. A pox and a plague on all hollow heads who practice what never did I preach. Milady, esteemed gentlemen, it is past the time when I must return. Ah, uh, parting is such sweet sorrow. Joe, wait. I feel I should repay you somehow for all the trouble to which we put you. <laughs> Goodbye! Oh, hey. Oh, hey. Hey. hey, he's gone. Just vanished. Well, can you blame even him after that gosh-awful pun of yours? How far sooth are oh. you going? True, the pun is the lowest form of wit. Well, perhaps. Certainly Shakespeare used many puns. 
The great John Milton even had Satan make them. Uh, puns are the basis of a lot of good humor. Uh, like the joke I opened up with. You, you all laughed at it. The one about Mrs. Katz. Well, that wasn't a bad joke. Yet there's another, perhaps more acceptable version if you'd care to hear it. Yeah, I like that. Very well, then. Uh, may I ask our joke demonstrators for version 13B of the Mrs. Katz joke? <laughs> I never thought I'd get here. I was just attacked by a man-eating rabbit. A man-eating rabbit? Yeah, I was in a restaurant, and a man-eating rabbit threw a punch at me. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good, Doctor. But uh, was it original? Heaven forbid. This, like most jokes, is what is technically known as a switcheroo. Now, let me show you how this is done historically. Uh, Joe Miller's joke number 99, please. <laughs> A lady questioned about her age affirmed she was 40 and called upon a gentleman for his opinion. I do not doubt it, madam, replied he, because have I not heard you say so the last 10 years? Now, let's see where Mr. Motley got it to include in the Joe Miller jests. Uh, Let's have the parallel joke from Armstrong's book, published 1630, please. A court lady had dinner and speaking of her age said she was 40. One gallant on hearing this whispered to his companion, I have not the faith to disbelieve her, for I've heard her say so any time these ten years. Oh. That's no switch, Doctor. That's out and out stealing. Even the numbers, 40 and 10. Yes, but the theft was Armstrong's because that joke, the joke he took his joke from, was current back in Latin times and Roman times in Cicero's day, and it went like this. Oh, noble Cicero, Fabia Dolabella saith she is but 30 summers. Would this be true? It must be true, for I have heard it these last 20 years. Oh. <laughs> are, there, are there other examples, Doctor? Uh, yes, c- come on, Professor. I've got my pencil and notebook already, but they've got to be better than that. Oh, there are dozens of examples, hundreds. Some I can't even quote because of the robustness of Elizabethan humor, and others which today are interesting, not for their shimmering wit, but only to scholars who seek sources. There's several jokes appearing in The Hundred Merry Tales, printed in 1500. That's a book that Shakespeare knew and referred to, by the way. The Hundred Merry Tales of 1500. There are jokes there, as well as in Archie Armstrong and Joe Miller, all similar, if not the same, and few of them are funny today. Well, if they were funny once, Doctor, why aren't they today? Let me give you one final example. Now, here's another joke, just as it appears in Armstrong's 17th century book. Two Dutchmen, one very tall, the other of exceeding low stature, were walking together. A pleasant gentleman, seeing them, said to his friend, Yonder go high Germany and the low countries. You call that a joke, Doctor? Yes, at one time it was a joke and a good joke and it enjoyed great vogue. But now, using it as a springboard, let's take a much more recent version, which dates back only a few years when the American theater man Marcus Lowe and the producer, Lee Schubert, were familiar figures on Broadway. Now, Marcus Lowe and Lee Schubert happened to pass one day, and this was their greeting. Hi, Lee. Hi, Lowe. <laughs> <laughs> so you see that Will Shakespeare was right when he wrote in Love's Labor's Lost, a jest's prosperity lies in the ear of him who hears it, never in the tongue of him who makes it. Yes, Doctor, but you're quoting Shakespeare, of course. Haven't you a theory of your own about what's funny and why? Well, as a matter of fact, I have a lot of fear. Come on, tell us. This is a dangerous business. Now, if one of you will be good enough to move that chopping block a little closer, I'll loosen my collar and lay my neck on the block. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) Professor. Let's not keep a frantic world in suspenders waiting for it. Let's have it. Have you given your theory a name, Doctor? Well, I suppose so. It seems to me, by the way, that, that when we laugh, most of the time, we laugh at someone who is doing something we'd like to do. We're all so inhibited and ruled and regulated by laws that whenever we see any person getting off second base safely, doing something that we'd like to do and can't, we acknowledge with a warm satisfaction of laughter the existence of one of our fellows who for a moment gets free. We say often to ourselves, I wish I'd said that, I wish I had done that, or I wish I'd seen that. You might call this the I wish I theory. Mm-hmm. I wish I? Well, uh, but Doctor, that's pretty much a generality, isn't it? Yes, of course. No one theory explains all jokes. But, to be specific, why doesn't one of you tell his favorite joke to the others and see if they think it's funny? Oh, we're not professionals. Why not let the comedian tell one of his? Yeah. Good, good idea. Okay, yes, okay. Let's, let's, let's take this one. The scene is an asylum. 
An inmate is looking over the wall, watching the gardener work. Finally, he says, hey, buddy, what are you doing? The gardener says, why, I'm putting fertilizer on the strawberries. The other guy screams, how do you like that? I put cream on mine, and they call me crazy. <laughs> I don't think that's funny. I think it's true. Well, fine, Dr. Baxter's, I wish I, really. I wish I hadn't heard it. Uh, you, don't <laughs> you don't know what's funny and what is it. Well, let's see if we do or not. I'll tell one I know knocks him in the aisles. It seems a farmer and his daughter were in the farmer's car driving back home with the money they'd just gotten in town selling their eggs. Well, suddenly the farmer spied two armed bandits approaching, so he whispered to his daughter, Mary, quick, stick that money in your mouth and hide it. Well, the girl did as she was told, and the hold-up men couldn't find the money, which made them so sore, they kicked them out and took the car. Well, once he was sure they were safe, the farmer said, I guess we was lucky, all right. But if your ma had been along, we could have saved the car, too. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, can't we have some order here? Gentlemen, please, some decorum, if you will. Uh, gentlemen, 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 please. Dr. Baxter, could I speak with you a moment, good professor? Why, Joe Miller, back again. What brings you back, Joe? I heard this idiotic argument, and I came back to assure you it was none of my doing, sir. Of course it isn't, but my, I'm glad you're back. You left before I could ask you to dine with me. Well, I, uh, I really shouldn't, you know. I uh, hate traveling after dark, but, uh, well, I shall make an exception, good doctor. Been so deuced long since I've had any solid food. And, uh, what shall the menu be? Well, now, how would a steak, a steak this thick, strike you? Ah, perfection itself. But, Brady, then, let's see. Do go, man. Then perhaps a salad of tossed California greens? Oh, the very words fairly titillate the gastric juices. And what shall we have with the coffee again? Why, why, anything you choose, Joe. Would you have strawberries, Doctor? You have all the strawberries your heart desires. Oh, not for me, good friend. Oh, strawberries for you. Why, Joe? Why strawberries for me? <laughs> because I want to see what you put on your strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it, good friends. Joe Miller's jests or the wit swaddy make them. Oh, ho. May Joe and his jests both leave us and rest in peace. <laughs> You've been listening to the CBS Radio Workshop's production of Colloquy 4, the Joe Miller Joke Book, with Dr. Frank C. Baxter, professor of English literature at the University of Southern California. Colloquy 4 was written, directed in Hollywood by Paul Franklin. Included in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Joe Kearns, Peter Leeds, Ben Wright, Dawes Butler, Howard McNear, Jay Novello, and Joe Forte. Sound effects by Gus Bays.